All right, as I mentioned in the last video, this video is kind of lengthy. So if you want to watch a little bit and then go away for a little bit and then come back and watch a little bit more, that's fine. Um, it does get a little lengthy, but I'll try and be as brief as possible. We're talking about linear congruences. Okay, so to introduce this topic, I want you to imagine a clock that only has a minute hand on it, so like the hour hand broke off or something like that. Um, whatever time you start with, after 11 minutes, the minute hand will be in a certain position. But after 71 minutes, it'll be in the same position, or after 131 minutes um, from when you originally started, or 191 minutes, or anything like that. The minute hand is going to be in the exact same position uh, from the start point, um, waiting each of these um, periods of time. And the reason for that is because, as you and I both know, um, minutes are grouped by 60. So every time 60 minutes passes, then the minute is the minute hand is in the same place that it was before we even start counting minutes over again after something 59. We start off at something o'clock. Okay, so I just want you to keep that in mind um, because that's kind of what modular arithmetic is. That's what we're talking about in this chapter. Okay, and I'm basically saying the same thing over again. Um, so this is modular arithmetic. Whenever you're dealing with time, the minutes of time, um, you're dealing in modulo 60. Um, that number, that 60, um, that kind of cycles, is called the modulus. And so we say that we're working modulo 60. And you write that in parentheses, mod 60. All right. So since all of those numbers... 11, 71, 131, 191. If you divide those all by 60, then you would get the exact same remainder. So if you get the same remainder with more than one number, then those numbers are all said to be congruent uh, with that modulus or congruent modulo 60. All right. So, and here's how you write it. It's kind of like an equal sign um, with another line underneath it, almost saying that it's like very equal to, but you know, I don't know if that's how you say it, but we say 131 is congruent to 11 mod 60. So those two numbers are congruent and the modulus is listed in parentheses with the word mod in front. Okay. And I could have just as easily said that 71 is congruent to 11 mod 60. So in general, if two numbers are congruent, then if you subtract those two numbers, then you will get something that your modulus divides into evenly. Um, take any of these two numbers and subtract them, and you will get something that 60 goes into evenly, whether it's 60 or 120 or 180, depending on which two numbers you choose. All right, so that's kind of a rule you can follow there. All right, um, so another way of saying this is if you take any one of those numbers and add a multiple of 60, you'll get any other number in that list. All right. So, yeah, that's basically what I'm saying. Um, if two numbers are congruent, then there's got to be some k um, where if I, multi if, if I add the modulus to one of the numbers a certain number of times, an integer number of times, then I'll get the other number. All right. So let's move on to an example. What we're going to do is we're going to find the remainder when 16 to the 47 is divided by 7. Well, you know that if you raise 16 to the 47, you're going to get a number that's really, really huge. Um, and your calculator might be able to handle the first several digits of that number, but after a while, it's just going to lose its accuracy. So why you would even want to know this, I don't know, but it just gives us practice for harder problems um, that will come up. So I know, for example, that 16 uh, has the same remainder when you divide it by 7 as 2 does. Uh, both give you a remainder of 2. Um, and you can check that by subtracting those, and if you subtract those, you get 14, which is a multiple of 7. So I know that they're congruent mod 7. They have the same remainder when they're divided by 7. All right, so what that means is, um, using a property of modular arithmetic, if I raise them to the same number, they will also be congruent. So 16 to the 47 would be congruent to 2 to the 47. All right, now here's where things get a little bit clever. 
Um, I've already made it easier because instead of figuring out what 16 to the 47 is, I have to figure out what 2 to the 47 is. So what I do is I think of my powers of 2. Well, 2 mod 7 isn't nice to work with. Um, if I raise that to the second power, I get 4 mod 7, which is actually worse. And if I raise 2 to the third, I get 8 mod 7. Well, 8 mod 7 is really nice because 8 has the same remainder as 1 when you divide them both by 7. So 8 and 1 are congruent with this modulus of 7. <clears throat> so I'm going to take out as many 2 to the thirds as I can out of this 2 to the 47 because every 2 to the third is the same thing as 1 mod 7. So if I think of 2 to the 47, um, I can take out 15 2 to the thirds, and then I'll be left with a 2 to the second. Sorry, 2 to the second. All right. And so as I said, each of those 2 to the thirds is 8, and 8 is the same thing, or it's congruent to 1 mod 7. So instead of 8 to the 15, I've got 1 to the 15, and 2 to the second is just 4. Well, a bunch of 1's times 4 is 4. So believe it or not, if I took 16 to the 47 and divided it by 7, um, I would have 4 as my remainder. So that's just one example of how to use properties of uh, modular arithmetic to make a seemingly challenging problem simpler. Now we get into what would happen if I had um, an equation like this. Okay, some integer times x is congruent to some other integer mod m. Okay, that's what they always look like. They'll have an x in them, and you'll be expected to solve them. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to check and see uh, how many solutions there are. All right, so pay attention to this because this is kind of tricky. Um, if you look at the GCD of this number in front and this number at the end. So always look at the beginning and the end and find the GCD of that. If that GCD is a factor of B, then there will be however many solutions there are when I talk about the GCD. Kind of hard to express that in words. Um, so I'm just going to give you an example. Let's look at this example where 9x is congruent to 15 mod 24. All right, well, 9, I'm going to look at the 9 and the 24, and I'm going to figure out the GCD of that. Well, the GCD of 9 and 24 is 3. I don't need to use Euclidean algorithm on that. That's kind of, um, I can just kind of eyeball that. And so I look and see if that GCD of 3 um, actually goes into this middle number here, this 15. And it does, so that means that there are going to be three solutions. Okay, whatever the GCD is, that's how many solutions there will be. Now I just need to know what they are. It's one thing to say how many there are. Now I need to figure out what those solutions actually are. All right, so let's do that. Um, we can divide each of the numbers, every single number in that original problem, by 3, right? So saying that 9x is congruent to 15 mod 24 is the same thing as saying that 3x is congruent to 5 mod 8. So I will actually divide everything by the GCD um, since everything is divisible by the GCD. So I start with 5. So I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this 5 and I'm going to keep adding 8s to it. And every time I add an 8, I'm going to create a number that is congruent to 5 mod 8. It's going to have the same remainder when I divide by 8. Um, so I'm just going to keep adding 8s until I get something that is divisible by 3. Remember, I can't use fractions in these problems. I have to use integers. So I'm going to keep going until I get um, a multiple of 3. Well, if I add 8 once, I get 13. And 13 is not divisible by 3. If I add 8 again, I get 21. And that is divisible by 3. So I'm just going to divide both sides by 3. So 3x divided by 3 is x. 21 divided by 3 is 7. So x is congruent to 7 mod 8. Okay, And if it's um, 7 mod 8 um, is, is going to be the same as 7 mod 24. So my solutions are 7 mod 24. And then I'm going to keep adding 8s 
um, to that. So 7 mod 24, if I add 8 to that, I get 15. If I add 8 to that, I get 23 mod 24. If I add 8 again, I get 31 mod 24, but that's the same thing as 7 mod 24. It's going to give me the same remainder as 7 would. Okay, so these are my three solutions. Obviously, there are infinitely many, but these are the three unique ones um, if I'm talking about mod 24, so anything between 0 and 23. Those are the only three that would work. All right, so now another example. I'm going to solve 18x is congruent to 144 mod 99. I'm going to, first of all, see uh, if there are any solutions. So I look at the first and last number, 18 and 99. The GCD of those is going to be 9. And if I look at the middle number, 9 is a factor of 144. So there are going to be 9 solutions. And again, I start off by dividing everything by 9 to make a simpler problem. So instead of 18x congruent to 144 mod 99, I can say that 2x is congruent to 16 mod 11. Okay. And actually, that works. I can say that x is congruent to 8 mod 11, and basically I've solved it. Uh, so anything that is 8 mod 11 is going to be a solution to this equation that I have at the top. So I'm going to take 8 and I'm going to keep adding 11s until I run out of numbers that are less than 99. So 8 works. Um, if I add 11 I get 19. If I add 11 more I get 30. If I add 11 more I get 41, then 52, then 63, 74, 85, and 96. And if I add 11 more, I will get uh, 107, which is higher than 99, and that actually gives me a remainder of 8 as well. So the whole thing cycles. All right. And so there's a second example of that. And I just want you to think about this for a second because all of these units that we're talking about, they seem to be very, very separate and compartmentalized. Um, but if you look at this process that we're doing, let's go back to the last example that we talked about, 18x is congruent to 144 mod 199. What that means is, remember our definition of what two congruent things are, that means if I subtract 18x and 144, that means that 99 will be a factor of that for some value of x. And what that means, so I'm saying that 18x minus 144 is some multiple of 99. So if it's some multiple of 99, I'm just going to say that it's 99 times some arbitrary integer y. And if I reorganize, I get 18x minus 99y equals 144. And I want the integer solutions to this. Well, that's a linear Diophantine equation. So this whole concept of modular arithmetic is very related to um, linear Diophantine equations. So you can solve linear Diophantine equations using congruences, or you can solve congruences using linear Diophantine equations, whichever one you're more comfortable with. But I do want you to understand the relationship between those two. Um, kind of went a little fast in today's lesson, so if you do have questions, and I expect you do, uh, please let me know, either email me or Facebook me, um, and I will get back to you as soon as I can, and I will see you tomorrow.